What's the word, y'all? I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I am buying all of the stock in the Charlotte Hornets for this upcoming season. I know. I, I know the track record of this franchise. I know the track record of their star player, and yet I can't stop convincing myself that this is going to be the year that they exceed all expectations. Whew. Okay. Um, over the last couple years, I felt this confident about a few different teams. Like, I, I try to pick a team that is middle of the pack slash miss the playoffs and think that this is going to be the year that they do their thing. Last year, I believed in the Atlanta Hawks. I missed that shot. They sucked. They didn't meet any expectations. I was so very disappointed. But the year before that, my team was the Sacramento Kings. And that team was one of the darlings of all the basketball, baby. Like the beam, like the beam. So this year, I'm going Charlotte Hornets. You think about it like this. I shoot 50%. And if we're talking three-point percentage, I'm one of the greatest, if not the greatest shooter of all time. But if we, we talking like free throw percentage, I'm awful. So it's really all about perception and interpretation, okay? In this video, I'll try to explain to you why I believe in the Charlotte Hornets. Maybe you take it with a grain of salt, maybe you don't. But, but let's say this right here. If they trade away Nick Richards to the New York Knicks, which is a rumor that is going around the association right now, then delete this video. I don't believe in them anymore. Why? It's not because Nick Richards is the saving grace of the Charlotte Hornets franchise, but it tells us the direction that this management group is going to. Are they saying that we have the core of LaMelo Ball, Brandon Miller, and, and Mark Williams, and we're ready to try to compete for a playing spot? Or are they saying we're still trading away assets to get future assets? I don't really know. So if they trade Nick Richards to the New York Knicks for second round picks and a salary filler, that tells me everything I need to know. But if we're going into the season with this roster, I believe that they could make some noise. Not They not go in the East or anything. You get me. So all of it starts here. I believe that the eight teams that were the top eight seeds in the Eastern Conference last year should all still be there. The Celtics, the Knicks, the Bucks, the Cavs, the Magic, the Pacers, the 76ers, the Heat. Those eight teams, I think we can agree, should be playoff teams slash playing teams this upcoming season, which means that there are two spots available for the ninth seed and the tenth seed. And here's my rationalization. The Chicago Bulls are probably not going to be there. Even if they're, um, our Tunis Carney Shova says, we're trying to win every single game. Hell, brother, if you don't have the talent, you don't have the talent. You can try all you want. You're not going to win a bunch of games. Then we have the Atlanta Hawks. And I picked them last year. They they were 10 games under. They were not great. And I just don't want to double down on that team, especially after some of the trades they did. Then you got the Brooklyn Nets, who are just going to try to be bad. We already made a video about them. The Washington Wizards are trying to be bad. We haven't made our video on them just yet, but we will assume. So it leaves us with three teams. The Toronto Raptors, who I, I like their roster. I like Darko Ryakovich. I'm going to save that for another video. It leaves us with the Charlotte Hornets, and it leaves us with the Detroit Pistons. And though the Pistons had a good offseason, which just having real NBA players coming to the team, I don't know if I see them going from a 14-win team to, let's say, a 36-win team. That's just a lot of wins to be added, unless Kay Cunningham has a superstar jump, which I guess is possible. And then, again, that just, that just has us laying on the Charlotte Hornets. Again, two of those teams are going to make the play-in. And one of them teams might make some noise and win two playing games in order to make the playoffs. Now, I, I admit, this is having a lot of trust in LaMelo Ball. We haven't seen a healthy LaMelo Ball season since 2022. He was the fourth youngest All-Star in NBA history behind Magic Johnson, LeBron James, and Kobe Bryant, which is one of my favorite stats of all time. I'm not saying LaMelo has that type of ceiling to be a ten, one of the 10 best players of all time, but that just showed what type of player he could be. Right. There are some conversations around him then. He's the next future superstar in basketball, so on and so forth. But because he's had his injury history, the conversation shifted from that to maybe the Charlotte Hornets should just focus on building around Brandon Miller. And in my mind, I think these two dudes should be on the same team for the foreseeable future because I think they fit each other. Maybe not like a glove, but very, very close. Again, we're talking about a 20 game sample size from LaMelo Ball. So it's hard to really take that and say like, he got better at this realm. He got better at this realm. But in that 22 game sample size, here are some things that I was impressed with. 20 something game sample size is crazy that I was impressed with. Um, one of my major criticisms about both of the Ball brothers is that they don't put pressure on the rim. Um, LaMelo did it a good amount his rookie season, then he stopped for two years straight. Was well, like, brother, are we going to shoot a floater after floater after floater after floater? How about we put our head down, draw some contact, get to that line slash make some layups? And last year, he had his second highest rate in his entire uh, career at like 34% of his shots were at the rim, which is pretty damn impressive when you compare it to 22% the year before that. His in-between game 
has evolved. Um, he's not going to be a guy that's going to stop and pop for mid-range jump shots very often. That's just not the NBA way. There's just a small percentage of players that get that done. But when he did decide to do that, and that counts kind of like he has that one-headed floater that he can shoot from the um, from the free throw line. He does it all the time. His percentage there, and I'm not just going to be talking about field goal percentages in this video, but he shot 44% on mid-range jump shots this season. That's pretty damn good. And he this, this season was his worst three-point shooting year at 36%. But I think that he was more... I don't know, deliberate about his three-point shot attempts versus previous years. And he shot 36% when the first 10 or 15 games of the season, he was shooting 22%. So the last couple games, again, 20-something game sample size, he started to really pick it up. And when I talk about him being deliberate about his three-point shots, early in his career, he definitely was more like, I am really about the flash. And that flash ain't going away, but it's gone down significantly over the course of his career. So part of that flash was, I'm going to shoot a 32-foot three-point shot 20 seconds, at, well, four seconds after me dribbling the ball up the court. I'm just going to get it up there. And if it hits, it hit for, for Instagram. And if it doesn't, nobody sees it because I'm playing in Charlotte, right? I thought this season he was way more deliberate in his shot taking and his shot making this year. And that's, that's great for his progression as a player. He still does turn the ball over more than I want from my starting point guard, but I just don't understand the idea of trading away this mode of player. A 6'7", super plus playmaker that can create for himself and create for others. Doesn't make sense to me, especially when you consider that your second most important player in Brandon Miller, who had a really, really good rookie season could use the spacing and the, the creation that LaMelo Ball brings to the team. Brandon Miller played with the 13th percentile in spacing, which means that he was playing in one of the, the smallest courts in basketball. His teams could not shoot to save their life, and he still went out there and created a good amount of shots. And he was such a good catch and shoot player that I just can't help but to think that he's going to be better next season based on him playing with LaMelo, who is great at creating shots for his teammates. So it's a, it's a big, big bet on LaMelo Ball staying healthy and continue his progression as an NBA player. The defensive side of the ball is always gonna be a knock for LaMelo Ball when you are 6'7 and, and you have all the defensive tools and you don't really do it very often. I know he's got that one play where he clamped up um, Tyrese Halliburton for game. He's got a few different plays like that, but a play-to-play -play basis, he's definitely a lollygagger, um, just a guy that doesn't stay in that stance and not completely locked in defensively. Hopefully that comes with time. Luckily, he's playing alongside Brandon Miller and Mark Williams. And, and with the Charlotte Hornets being so very bad last season, Brandon Miller still showed that he is going to be a great defensive player in the league eventually. But I just, over the last couple of days, because I knew the Charlotte Hornets was coming up, I've been watching a lot of Brandon Miller film because I won't lie to you, I didn't watch a ton of them second half of the season because they weren't playing for anything. So I went back to watch a few games, watch a bunch of footage of Brandon Miller, and he's silky smooth. Um, he used the pick and roll a lot, especially towards the second half of the season to create for himself. He's not a guy, at least at this point of his career, that is a plus playmaker, but I think that could come with time. But he has the mold to be a really prototypical, big defensive, uh, create self-creation wing. And I know he says that his favorite player of all time is, is Paul George. You can tell that by watching him play. Shooting 42% on self-created pull-up jump shots is insane for a what? A 20-year-old rookie. That is insane to me. I, I need y'all to really think about 42% on pull-up shoot through a uh, mid-range jump shooting for a 20-year-old. It's insane volume at, for one and also success. And I just, I'm just buying in on him continuing to get better and better as the players around him get better. And the last super important piece of this course, Mark Williams, who also has not been healthy for some time. I think he played 20 something games and it was supposed to be like a lower back contusion and he'd end up not playing for the rest of the season, which is a little bit scary, but um, he is a, a rebounder out of this world, offensively, defensively. Um, he can come to the point of attack as a defender, which again shows crazy versatility for the young guy who's seven feet tall. I just believe in all of these dudes progressing together and maybe that's Maybe that's naive of me to think that's going to happen when you think about such a young core, but I like what they have going on over there. They have new management and a new coach, and I, I really do believe in that new coach approach in a lot of cases where I can't say we don't know a lot about Charles Lee because he's been in the NBA for 10 years now. He started as an assistant coach at 19 years old, and now he's finally get his head coaching job. But we don't really know what his philosophies are going to be other than from the few interviews I've watched. He wants to improve the defense, which is extremely important if you want to win basketball games. And he also wants to continue the pace that the, that the Hornets have been playing with over the last couple seasons. That's all I really know about him as a coach. But I watched the damn Charlotte Hornets documentary when they were going through the draft process 
process and they were introducing the new guy that's in charge. They were introducing the new coach and everything. And I was like, these dudes, I, I, I believe in these dudes. And maybe again, that, maybe that's naive of me. Maybe that's naive of me. But I believe in Charles Lee being able to get a good amount of success out of this roster. And here's the rest of it, right? Miles Bridges resigned a what, three years, $75 million. Good NBA player. That's all I can really say about him. Obviously, there's some other stuff. Uh, but the starting five doesn't look too bad. They took a flyer on Josh Green. They got they traded second round picks for Josh Green. That's an amazing trade to me because Josh Green has played in big games throughout the course of his career already. And I believe that here when he is a, what, 38% uh, corner three-point shooter, that he can really showcase some value again um, here with the Charlotte Hornets, again, with the creation of LaMelo Ball. Micic, if we get the Serbian um, national team version of Micic, they in a real good spot. Now, obviously, the depth. Ain't too crazy, right? Trey Mann, after he got traded there, had some moments. But for the most part, you know, you see him as a reserve. And I think that's probably going to be the way it works. And there's a world where he does start with Brandon Miller and Josh Green comes off the bench. I guess it really depends on what Mr. Lee is uh, deciding to do. Grant Williams got traded here and he changed the whole vibe of the locker room. He had a career year in those, what, 20 to 30 games that he played there. And I already mentioned Nick Richards is one of the more underrated centers in basketball. And if he uses a backup, those are good minutes. Like, I like this team. Um, and the projections aren't good for them. I know they're not good for them, but I do believe that they can be better than what they're projected to be. The rosters are dramatically different, but the last time LaMelo Ball was healthy, his team won 43 games. Now that was a more veteran led roster when you have a Rozier and you have a Hayward and so on and so forth. But in my personal opinion, a healthy season of LaMelo raises this floor and the ceiling quite significantly. And I believe in that. Did I make any compelling arguments? Basically, the main argument is like, if they're healthy, this is an okay roster. I could This video could have been 30 seconds long. If the Charlotte Hornets are healthy, this is an okay roster with an intriguing coach. Done.